Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Hangout, and thank you for joining us to celebrate the anniversary of Public Law 99-457. I'm Ruth Ryder, Acting Director of the Office of Special Education Programs, and I'm excited to be joined today by Carolyn Hayer, Director of Parent and Professional Development at the Statewide Parent Advocacy Network in New Jersey, and the parent of a young adult with disabilities, Kathy Hebler, Program Manager at SRI International and Co-Project Director of the DAISY Center, Andy Gom, Acting Bureau Chief, Child and Family Supports, State Department of Health in New Mexico, and Teresa Barubi, 619 uh, Preschool Coordinator for Nebraska. If you have comments during today's discussion, please post them on the Google Hangout or on Twitter at hashtag babyidea is 30. In 1986, the Education for All Handicapped Children's Act was amended to be the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, PL 99457. IDEA supported the right to early intervention services for all infants, toddlers, and preschoolers with disabilities and to those at risk of having a substantial developmental delay. Part H of IDEA was established to give states the option to provide early intervention services to eligible infants and toddlers ages birth through two years. In 1997, um, during the reauthorization, it was changed from Part H to Part C. Part C provides formula grants to states to assist them in implementing statewide systems of coordinated, comprehensive, multidisciplinary interagency programs. Section 619 of IDEA's Part B was established and required services to children with disabilities ages three through five. Part B, Section 619 provides formula grants to states to provide a free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment to children with disabilities ages three through five. The number of infants and toddlers participating in Part C over the years has been steadily increasing. In 1999, there were approximately 187,000 children served, and in 2014, there were well over 350,000 being served. The percentage of children served in Part C is almost 3% almost of the infant and toddler population. This is based on a point-in-time count. The number of preschool children participating in Part B, Section 619, it has also been increasing steadily over time. In 1998, there were approximately 572,000 children served, and in 2014, there were over 753,000 being served. The percentage of children served in Part B, Section 619, is approximately 6% of the three through five-year-old population, again, based on a, a point-in-time count. So I joined the department in 1988, and at that time, um, the preschool and Part C programs were being treated as discretionary grant programs. I didn't actually start working with them until about 1995, and at that time, we started working very hard with states to establish their, their policies and procedures and started really creating a community of Part C coordinators um, part H at the time, coordinators and 619 coordinators to support each other in this important work. A goal of IDA services is to enhance the development of young children with disabilities and to minimize the potential for developmental delay. Um, I'd like to start um, by asking Kathy Hebler a question. Kathy, what have we learned over the years on how Part C and Section 619 benefit young children with disabilities and their families. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, hi, as, as Ruth said, um, I am the one of the co-directors of the uh, DAISY Center. Um, we're a data center and I'm a numbers person and Ruth has given you some numbers and I want to give you a few more. Um, 30 is a really good number, but there are a lot of numbers that go along with that 30. Uh, one of those numbers is millions and Ruth gave you some of the year-to-year -year numbers, but the millions refers to the millions of children who have received Part C and 619 services since the programs were created. 
I can't give you an exact number, but I tried to do some calculations, and I think it's probably between 10 and 15 million children have benefited from early intervention and preschool special education over the last 30 years. And of course, many of them are not children anymore. Some of them are young adults and teenagers. So what happened to them? Well, we've not followed all of them, but let me tell you what we know. But before I do that, I want to talk to you about who has served in IDEA's early childhood programs. And I know many of you know this, um, but you can't really understand what happens to these children without also thinking about who they are. There is one word that describes them. That word is diverse. They are preemies. They are children with genetic conditions, some of which have minor implications for their development, and some of which have very serious implications. For most of these children, no one knows why they are not developing the way they sh should. But for many of them, it is their communication skills that are not developing properly. One of these things that all of these infants, toddlers, and preschoolers have in common is that no one knows what they are capable of as 10-year-olds or 20-year-olds. But we do know that without the services and supports that IDEA provides, they will not achieve what they are capable of achieving. So, hold on to the notion that IDEA serves a very diverse population of young children. Now let's talk about what happens to them. As I said, we've not followed all these children into their 20s, but from two national longitudinal studies, we do know that many of these children look just like their classmates when they get to elementary school. Developmentally, they are just fine. And it's also true that many from within this diverse group will continue to need special education services. They have not caught up with their peers, but they enter kindergarten with many more skills than they would have without IDA. And their parents are better prepared to support their learning and development. If you are a policymaker or if you are someone who talks to policymaker, policymakers, do note that IDEA's early childhood programs have saved hundreds of thousands of dollars over 30 years because they have changed the life course of millions of children. We want to celebrate that, but we also want to look at where we are going. We've built the systems that provide the services, but now we need to be asking, are we achieving the best outcomes we can for every child and family receiving IDEA services? It's not enough to just look at two studies. We need to look at outcomes for every child in Parts C and 619. Teachers, early interventionists, therapists, families, all need to know if children are making progress. State agencies need to know if there are programs in their state where children are not making as much progress as they are in other programs. And then they need to help those programs become better programs. All across this country, state agencies and local programs are working hard to collect and use data on outcomes for children in early intervention and early childhood special ed. Because states collect and report data on outcomes, we know nationally that about three out of four of these children are showing greater than expected growth in at least one outcome area, and over half are leaving the program showing skills expected for their age in at least one outcome area. We've spent many years building the systems to provide IDEA services to children and their families. And now we are ready to go the next step, looking closely at the results these children are achieving. Overall, we already know it is good news, but we need to make sure it is good news in every program for every child in every community. We still don't know what these children are capable of, but it is a lot more than we thought they were capable of. My hope is that we spend the next 30 years using data on outcomes to make sure that every child and every family is getting the best service we know how to deliver. So with that, I say happy anniversary to Baby IDEA. Um, we are so proud of what you have achieved and we're looking forward to many more great things to come. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you for the really important work that you've been doing around improving outcomes for young children with disabilities. And we appreciate hearing about the diverse millions of young children that, that we have impacted in Part C and Section 619. 
Um, I'm going to ask a question to Teresa now. Teresa, you currently serve as the Part B Section 619 coordinator in Nebraska and have been in the field for many years. Um, can you share your experience on the importance of providing high quality services to young children and their families? Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, the importance of children and families at, at the Part C and B619 levels I don't think can be understated. The need for us to meet families at where they're at, the children where they're at, and be able to improve those children's outcomes is critical. Under IDEA, we've been given a great gift um, that allows us to address those unique learning challenges that children face, allowing us to address those in the most natural and positive way that we can do that. By adding in the piece and the importance of natural environments, we have children who are now have the opportunity to spend the time working on the things that they want to participate in, activities they want to participate in, and including in building family capacity and their children's ability to participate. And a critical component of that is the inclusive setting. And that may be a challenge for us across the, across the nation. And I know that we have lots of places where trying to provide inclusive settings is, is a challenge. But it's critical that we do that. The research that we found um, has shown that we know children learn best from their typically developing peers. And through IDEA and the provisions under natural environment, it really does give us a unique opportunity to really move that bar for each and every child and each and every family as they move forward in their educational system. The other advantage we have is we have some wonderful, fantastic providers who are now in universities and ongoing higher education that is preparing our future leaders in this area to develop specific learning and support for those children and their families in birth to three as well as three to five and then continuing through from some endorsements that go from birth through that early childhood age of eight. And looking at those continuums and being able to really shore up our, our strong professionals who are able to meet those children where they are, helping them improve their skills that way, cannot be understated or undervalued. One example of this would be a family that we worked with that um, we started on early intervention with the family, and we got in. The family had concerns about speech and language. You build connections with those families that are so critical that when you start having conversations that are difficult, like the one we had to have with the family around the fact that the child um, was most likely um, going to be on the autism spectrum. That was an incredibly difficult conversation to have with those families, but because we're providing our, our providers with the amount of uh, support and education that they've had previous, they're able to support those families through those difficult transitions and show those families that as their child progresses and moves through an inclusive environment and gets those educational supports, their child can participate and achieve just as well as any other child in their in their classroom and at their age. So as we look at the entirety of the changes that have come, come through in the last 30 years, it is staggering to see the difference in where children are spending their time now and the expectations and the supports and, and strength that we can provide for families now that we weren't able to do 30 years ago, and IDEA needs to be commended for forward thinking in that capacity. Thank, thank you, Teresa. Um, and thank you for reminding us about the importance of inclusive settings and uh, children with, with disabilities receiving services with their typically developing peers. Um, also appreciated you uh, talking about the importance of um, really high quality providers. That really is, is a, a hallmark, I think, of our IDEA programs. You also um, reminded us about the importance of families, and I'd like to turn to Carolyn um, and ask her, uh, Carolyn, we know that family engagement is a critical component of both, both Part C and Part B Section 619. Can you discuss the impact these programs have had on families and the role of parent training and information centers and community parent resource centers in supporting families of young children with disabilities. Yes, thank you very much, Ruth. Um, I think it's uh, very important that we recognize how wonderful it is that um, the ages of birth 
through three and three to five are such critical periods of life for our children. And families are very, very involved in what is happening. And when a child is diagnosed with a disability, uh, it's a very trying time for families. And it's the role of parent centers to help them and get through that process and to support them. Uh, the fact that these services are family-centered is really critical that parents understand their role and have the ability to participate effectively so that they can ensure that their children are receiving the services that they need and are entitled to. Parent centers are there to provide families with information, resources, uh, supports. We connect them with other families who may be going through the same types of experiences and help families to understand what their role is in these systems and be part of the decision-making processes that are going to affect the outcomes for their children. Uh, it's a very uh, positive impact and, and um, strength developing and skill developing process when families can be involved in the decisions regarding their children and can make sure that they're learning from the providers on how they too can support their children and enhance their learning and their development. It was noted earlier how important it is for children to receive their services in the natural environment. This is something that parent centers ensure families understand and know how to access those services in the natural environment so that they can improve outcomes for young children. We also make sure that families understand what their rights are within the system. And parents have a lot of rights with regard to the evaluation and assessment of their children, meetings that are held with regarding to providing their children services, and what those services are. And so it can be very challenging. We speak with many families who call us. Um, they're emotionally um, struggling and going through a very difficult time. And now they are entering uh, the service provision system that frequently they're not even aware of until they're um, inserted into it. And they need a lot of support. And that's what we are here to provide. Um, I'd like to share a story with you of a family that we've worked with um, whose child was experiencing some developmental delays. And uh, the parents were unaware of the early intervention system and really did not know where to turn for help. And it was another parent that they um, were friends with that suggested that they contact their local parent center for some information. And we were able to work with that family and as it turned out, um, they had another child that also was in need of services. And so ultimately, both children began receiving services the parents became very involved in the process um, and have, have been involved with our organization for well over 10 years now. Um, parent centers should be contacted and referred to families because our resources come in a variety of formats. Um, we have resources, print resources, uh, resources available in multiple languages. Uh, we actually, on our website right now, have a set of um, videos on the gallery section where we're talking to both families and service providers about what the process is so that when families do make that initial phone call, they know what to expect and um, what a particular parent's journey has been and what they appreciated about the support that they got along the way. Um, we have so many stories of families who, once they have connected with the parent center, it's not just through the early intervention and early childhood issues uh, time period, but then they're reported that they are better prepared once their child is school age and navigating through that system as well. So it's um, a pleasure to be a part of this opportunity to uh, celebrate the 30th anniversary um, we're uh, appreciative of, of this opportunity to share with you our work with families and um, we look forward to the future and to continuing this work.
Thank you, Carolyn. I really appreciate you discussing the um, really critical role of the parent centers. Um, I, I think you did a really nice job of, of discussing how it often is a difficult time for parents of, of infants um, when they start understanding their child's disability and, and learning about the system and the parent centers do such a great job of helping families through that. Um, and often one of the things that the parent centers are doing is um, helping parents understand other programs that their child might be engaged in in the early childhood world. And I'd like to turn to Andy. Andy, you've worked as a Part C coordinator for many years and have had the experience of coordinating with other early childhood programs to ensure that young children and their families get the services and supports that they need. Can you talk about the importance of Part C and Part B Section 619 programs to the broader early childhood field? Hi, good afternoon, Ruth. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this celebration. And it really is exciting. Um, sometimes milestones give you the opportunity to look back at where we've come. And particularly for New Mexico, we were using this opportunity to look back at how things were 30 years ago when we really didn't have early intervention services available in all communities. And so the passage of that law really meant that now um, all families, wherever they be in New Mexico, whether they're living on a Native American Indian community, uh, way down a rural ranch road, a small mountain village, or, or here in some of our, our towns that all those um, children and families get served. And for me personally, um, I got involved with early intervention um, through uh, Idea Part C, then Part H, in the early 90s on the Navajo Nation uh, in Arizona, before coming here to New Mexico um, to become the Part C coordinator. As we know, um, the coordination of services that Part C is the lead agency for often you know, really requires us to work in collaboration with our partners, um, whether that be medical services, mental health, infant mental health, uh, nutrition services, our schools for the deaf and blind, et cetera. Um, but as Teresa said earlier around uh, her comments around the 619 preschool services, um, Often we're working in partnership with other early learning, early childhood providers. So we're talking early Head Start and Head Starts, our childcare providers, and then other, sometimes other state funded preschool and pre-K programs. And so that often means us actually providing direct supports and services there. And I think, and Teresa spoke to some of this, but um, often that means not only us supporting that individual child through their IFSP, um, or IEP, but also supporting the capacity of the classroom staff to be competent and confident in their ability to serve young children with disabilities and developmental delays. So I think that's one way that both Part C and 619 uh, support the wider early learning system. I think another area I wanted to highlight uh, is around child find and identification of young children uh, with developmental delays and disabilities. And many states have coordinated efforts around this, um, particularly around screening, whether that's um, at child find events or setting up uh, systems of periodic screening. So we're not missing children so that they get identified early and get the services that they need. And in terms of the early learning world, particularly a new partner, a fairly new partner has been increasing collaboration with um, home visiting, whether that's federally funded home visiting, state funded home visiting, and uh, in our state sometimes even um, foundation funded. Um, so uh, an increasing number of referrals are starting to come in from our home visiting partners. So those are two areas I think particularly that Part C and 619 contribute and are, are strong partners with our other early learning um, programs in our states. But I, I wanted to speak for a minute, if I could, about um, what I think is a real paradigm shift that's happening away from us working, um, supporting individual kids and doing good collaboration and around those two other areas. And that is um, a paradigm shift that's really moving us away from working in isolation or sometimes what's called in silos to one of real collaboration and shared governance around early learning and early childhood services. And um, I think really 
the um, U.S. Department of Education, OSAs, OSAP, and their partners at Health and Human Services need to be commended for modeling a lot of the collaboration that's now going on through shared administration of, of early learning, early childhood services between those two federal agencies and the increasing training, policy memos, and the promotion of state advisory councils. And so I think right from the top, um, the federal government is really encouraging us to break down those barriers between, um, between the early learning programs. Because after all, families need care, families need support, children need intervention. And we, in some ways, artificially through funding and our laws, uh, break those um, into different programs. But really, we need to be working together to support our young children. At the state level, uh, and I know from talking to my colleagues, they're feeling this too, is that um, much more of our work than ever is working in partnership with other early learning programs. Many states have reorganized their state structures into early learning offices. Um, or departments, um, or some, some like ours have um, new governance structures where we're still within our state lead agencies, um, but we work much more collaboratively and planfully together. Um, also at the state level, there's other things going on around uh, shared professional development, working together in planning and advisory um, through our state uh, early learning councils or state advisory councils. Many states have worked collaboratively across programs to develop early learning standards. I know in our state and many others, they're looking at aligning or integrating data systems so we can also have the data that we need to plan uh, thoughtfully into the future. Um, some states, particularly here, uh, are looking at quality rating systems and how can we align them, and numerous other uh, initiatives that mean that much more of our work than ever, and it's really needed uh, for us to work uh, and plan together with our colleagues in other early learning programs. And I think that's just going to increase into the future. The personal story I wanted to share uh, is very personal. It's uh, uh, the fact, and I think it's a good illustration of how early learning programs do work together, and that is that some of you know that last year, when my son was born, he had a difficult birth, a difficult birth history, and ended up being in the NICU for the first month of his life. And um, he got great care at the NICU, uh, was supported developmentally, and we as a family were supported and made sure um, that we were obviously connected to supports. Somehow I think I might have known how to make those connections when I left the hospital anyway, but it was nice to it's amazing once you have a child with special needs, how much you forget or how much you, you're just like any other parent and need support. So uh, we got early intervention from the moment uh, we got home and um, we were supported and coached as a family by our early intervention team. Our son uh, was also for the first year of his life in an early Head Start setting. And so our, our early intervention team supported the early Head Start folks to know how to support Alejandro's development. Um, and re more recently, we've moved him from early Head Start to a childcare uh, setting. It's a high quality childcare setting. We're very happy with it. And our early intervention team continues to support them. So I think it's a great illustration um, of how um, just in one child's life, and he's only 15 months old, how he's been already touched with uh, three early learning systems that have worked together to support us as a family and um, to support his development. And I'm pleased to, to announce that he's doing great. And um, uh, I think Kathy, he'll um, show up in great outcome um, survey data um, years from now. So with that, I'll close. And um, just to say that I'm looking forward to the next 30 years. I think we'll look back on this time uh, as we're building our early learning systems in states and at the federal level to think how could we ever not have worked collaboratively together and we'll have a system that's seamless and aligned across our early learning programs and, and um, that's my hope anyway and, and it'll be interesting. I don't know where I'll be in 30 years, but it will be fun to look back at that time. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for sharing your personal story. And, and also thank you for 
um, recognizing the work that we're doing at the federal level, um, a lot of really good collaborative work. And um, you mentioned the policy statements, and I, I hope that if you're not aware of the policy statements, others, that you will um, seek them out because they are really very um, powerful documents. Um, I want to thank Kathy, Teresa, Carolyn, and Andy for participa participating in our Google Hangout. Um, thanks to all of you for participating in today's discussion. We can see from the discussion how Part C and Part B, Section 619 have played a critical role within the early learning system to ensure that all young children have the services and supports that they need to reach their full potential. Um, please go to um, our website. Our early learning website is ed.gov slash early learning. Um, you can view videos and read blogs from others celebrating the 30 years of innovation and high quality services through Part C and Part B Section 619. What a great time, as Andy said, to be part of early learning with so many gains over the last 30 years and so much more to do. And um, I, like you, Andy, don't know where I'll be 30 years from now, um, but hopefully Part C and Section 619 will be um, moving along and doing great things. Happy anniversary, Part C and Part B, Section 619.